to incite from us a response. I won't use any skill as a preacher. I won't do any of those things. I will just preach his word because I am confident in that. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll have it on the screen. But if you do have a Bible, I would, would love it if you grabbed it and turned with me to Isaiah 66. If you have an iPad or an iPhone or an Android or anything like that, the Bible apps on there are good as well. After that, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 3. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. I already love what I feel. I like being around passionate people, and I can tell that that's what I'm around. And uh, there's nothing more terrifying than speaking to God's wife. You're his bride. And so I intend to keep that on the front of my mind today, that I'm speaking to God's sweetheart, and I want to treat you as such. And to the ministry in here, I want you to stir up the gifts within you and minister with me today. If you feel at any point to go pray with somebody, please, please obey the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Brother Burkett, for allowing me to be here. I love your family. I'm thankful I got to spend time with your, your son-in-law and daughters at camp this year. We love them. I'm very, very thankful for them, and I'm honored to get to be here, spend a little bit more time with y'all. Love you, Gentry. Love y'all. Thankful for every one of you. Isaiah 66, 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. And this is a, an interesting thing that we don't think about a lot. God says, where's the house? Where's the house that you will build me? And here's the most puzzling part is, where is the place of my rest? Well, God, I thought you were my rest. Did it ever dawn on us that God is looking for a place to rest himself? That he's looking for a house to dwell in where he will rest? And this right here gives us a little mind's eye into the nature of God, that he's looking for a house to rest in it. What is this house? Hebrews 3 gives us a little bit more insight to this place that he's looking for. It says, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. You did not come to the house of God today. You came to a building and the house walked into it. We are the house and we are the place that he's looking to rest in. I asked God, I was in Michigan preaching a revival when God shared this with me. And when I read that, I said, God, what do you mean you rest? And this is what he told me. We've got three children, one in the grave, and they we just got one finally. The last one's in diapers. And God spoke to me. He said, how many times have you said when Gideon can learn how to go to the bathroom by himself, when he can sleep all night, then you and your wife will rest. He said, when you mature, I can rest. When I can use you and you're not up and down and you're just steadfast unmovable, always abounding. He says, I've moved you out of diapers into manhood and I can begin to rest in this house. God is looking for a mature people. And that's just, that's just a little part of it. I want to talk about the house though, because I feel like that's what he's most passionate about. God enjoys every stage, infancy to adulthood. But I want to talk about his most passionate topic, his house. I'm going to use a different title. I want to, I want to minister today, the final wall. I believe he's building a house right now, and I believe he just, he started last year on this final wall. I believe prophetically, we're standing in a unique place, and I want you to grasp this word. I've ministered this in a few other places, and I just feel a release from God to keep ministering it, and it's not, it's not because of a lack of study. It's just I feel a burden and a passion for this word, and I feel like it's a prophetic word that people need to grab hold of. Now, would you do this with me? Would you lift up your hands? And the Bible uses the word soul. Would you give him your soul? The word soul in Greek is psyche. Would you give him your minds right now? That's the place where he sits. He likes to sit upon the highest point of the man and the woman, and that's our mind. He wants to minister to your thoughts. 
He wants to cast down imaginations, every thought that would exalt itself against the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He wants to come against all that. He wants to sit and reign upon high. He wants a throne upon your mind. So now with that, would you give him your mind? Would you set your affections upon things above and not on things of this earth? Would you give him your every thought? Would you declare it with your mouth and just say, God, for the next few moments, I'm going to think about you. I'm going to listen to your word. Not only in this service, but when I leave, I'm going to meditate on your word. I'm going to meditate upon it like Psalm 1 says. I'm going to meditate upon it day and night. God, I'm going to do like Deuteronomy 24 that says I'm going to sit with this word and meditate upon it. I'm going to write it down. Would you do that right now and just offer them up your mind? Father, I thank you for your people. I'm thankful for such a wonderful group of individuals that are in this room. I humble myself to you first and foremost and to these great people. God, there are ministers in this room who can minister profoundly. I want to join with them today, God. There are singers and musicians that are so anointed, God. I just want to join with them. God, this is not a platform for me to do anything other than to minister to your people. God, would you anoint me, the vessel. God, would you pour yourself out. There's nothing special about the vessel. It's what's inside of it. God, would you pick this cup up and would you pour me out upon this room. And God, would you move on your people. Nothing of any value will take place unless you're here. And so, God, I give myself to you and I humble myself to your bride. And would you speak to us in this place. In the name of Jesus. Now, would you just say amen? seated. It is abundantly clear from the Bible that God is infinitely passionate about a house. This is seen early on in the very first pages of the Bible when rather than formally introduce himself, rather than showing us himself riding in on a mighty horse, he does not show us an infinite army. He does not show us even a crown. God doesn't do anything. In fact, God's name isn't even mentioned in the first chapter of the Bible. It says in Hebrew, Barashit bara Elohim, which is in the beginning God created. Creation was at the forefront of his mind, and what he created shows us the absolute heartbeat and nature of God because he focuses intently on the construction of a house. And rather than pour a foundation made with concrete and rebar, the foundation of the earth was his word and his word alone. And his word was strong enough to hold everything suspended in space and time. And upon his word, he creates the heavens in the earth. But he doesn't stop there because he also creates a garden in the earth, which is the place where he would place his most prized creation, humanity. And most importantly, though, beyond humanity, beyond earth, beyond space and time, the most beautiful part of the creation narrative is the fact that God dwelled there with them. That is the whole point of the house. It's not just to have a house for the sake of having one. It is not just to have humanity just for the sake of having humanity. We are not his pets. We are not some little finite being. That is what we are, but we are made in the image of God, and that puts us into a unique position here on this earth because nothing else in creation did he breathe into other than humanity. It's something unique about humans that God was attracted to, not as a pet so to speak, but as one that he would dwell with. If we were a pet, then he could train us. If we were a pet, then he would, he would take over our will. And yet, for some reason, he gives us a will, full on knowing that we will betray him with that will. But having us and knowing that we would walk away is something far more bearable than never having humanity at all in the mind of God. So God went ahead from the foundation of the earth and developed a plan that when we walk away, he will go ahead and be slain at the foundations of the earth. That would be his plan to get us back. But right now in the moments of infancy, he relished in the idea of simply being with us. On the seventh day, he rests in this home with his creation. You have to understand that there was a garden in 
Eden. Eden was not the end all. Eden was the inner court. But the most holy place was the garden where God and humans would be together. The outer courts was the rest of his creation. And it was all beautiful, but God's most pleasurable place. And this is why it's called Eden in Hebrew, which means pleasing. It's not because it was beautiful, although it was. It's not because of the vast array of colors, even though it was colorful. The beauty and the pleasing part of it and the reason why God called called it Eden or pleasurable was because he got to dwell there with us in a house. He was at rest. And this rest is disrupted at the immaturity of humanity. Because unfortunately, this home was not valued and it was sold for an astonishing low price of one piece of fruit. The worst house flip in all of history. And though man moved out, it didn't diminish the passion of God to have a house where he could rest. It's unique and it frustrates us and it almost pokes fun at the sensibilities of a human as we see and read and we don't understand this infinitely wise God. Why would he set carabim around the tree of life, keeping us from reaching out to it and living forever? That seems like a cruel God. That doesn't seem right. If we serve this loving God, why has he set a, a guard around this tree of life? Because we were broken now. And if we reach out from the tree of life in the state of brokenness, we live eternally broken. And so his grace says, nope, I can't allow you access to eternity until I heal brokenness. Until I can repair your image back into mine by becoming distorted for your distortion, then I can give you eternity back. So for a season and a time, I will withhold from you the eternal until I can heal the temporal. And when I heal the temporal, I'll give you eternity back because I don't want you to live forever broken. And when you view the grace of God through that lens, it is no longer a strange God. It's not a cruel God. It's a gracious God who says, let me heal the brokenness first. But in the meantime, let me scatter throughout the pages of the Holy Writ my extreme passion to show you why I will heal and mend the house because I want to move into it. But to do that, I need to restore it. So let me go through throughout time and show you in many ways, in as many ways as possible to show you what my passion is. Because even at this moment, God still builds a house. He sets out to build another one. In this time, it's not one in a garden. It's a little micro garden. It's called the tabernacle. And I think it's prophetic and I think it important for us to notice that God said, I want this tent made out of flesh. Now, understand how offensive this is, Brother Gentry. We just left Egypt, and we've been living and worshiping gods in pyramids. The gods of Egypt were extravagant. Beauty and splendor, they would put these huge pyramids. No expenses were spared in building these extravagant houses for the gods of Egypt. And you, the God of all gods, have called us into the wilderness. And the place where you have chosen to dwell is in a little ragtag tent made out of flesh. Yep, not only that, I'm going to make it even more offensive. And you can imagine they were excited as they set up the tent poles and they covered it. He said, I want you to put beautiful linen on the walls. All right, okay, it's not a pyramid, but at least it's got extravagant and exotic walls. And he said, I want it to be purple and I want it to be scarlet and royal blue. Okay, all right, it's, it's, it's not that ugly. It's going to be a decent house. He said, now I want you to cover that up with ram skins. But God, look how beautiful it is. Oh, I know, that's going to be the interior walls. I want all the beauty on the inside, but on the outside, I want it to be lowly and humble. Cover it in ram skins, dyed red. Okay, well, at least it's, it's a beautiful color, red. No, I want you to put on, outside of that, I want you to put badger skins. There was no beauty nor comeliness in this temple. No one would desire this tabernacle made with flesh. And yet, only the priests were allowed to go in and see the beautiful scarlet and purple and royal blue linen walls until they came outside and they were wearing the linen ephod and they had the turban around, or they had the sash around their waist and the turban on their head, which was white, purple, and blue. As the priests came out of that house, all the Israelites who weren't allowed in the house got to see what the walls were on the outside of the priests. 
I'm wearing the extravagance and the beauty of the interior. You get to see the inside of this house as I'm wearing it in front of you. So they would come out and they would get a glimpse of the beauty of the interior while the priests were sewing it in the exterior. They were wearing the interior walls as their clothing. But all the gold, all the beautiful, all the furniture, all the stuff was on the inside of the house. And God said, this is beautiful. This is a house. I want to dwell in a house made of flesh. God, that's a little embarrassing. And then we get Hophni and Phinehas who sell this beautiful house Again, because of their desire, their hunger. It's not for a piece of fruit. They're sticking a fork into a piece of, of, of meat, which was supposed to be dedicated unto God. And they took for themselves the meat of the sacrifice. It's a fun little study if you go study it out. Again, hunger sells the house. They flip the house because of their hunger. And God says, okay, who's going to build me a house? where I can rest. I need a house to dwell in. I need a place where I can rest. I want you to build me a house. And so then David says, I will build you a house, oh God. I'm going to build you this extravagant house because you're, you deserve to, to live in beautiful cedars of Lebanon. And God says, who, when did I ask you for cedars of Lebanon? God asked David, when did I ask you for extravagance? I was content with flesh. But if that's what you want to build, I will dwell in it, not because of its extravagance, but I, because I get to meet with you there. The whole point is build it however you want to, but the whole point of the house is because I get to see you face to face. That's why it's called a tabernacle. The word tabernacle means dwelling place or meeting place. It's a place where he gets to meet with us face to face like a friend. That's the whole point of the tent of meeting. He says, build me a house. And so Solomon stands up. David's son, and he builds a house after 440 years of utilizing the humble flesh house. He builds this powerful house, and watch how it looks in 1 Kings 5. He says, and behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name's sake. Now, therefore, command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know there is none among us who is skilled to cut timber like the Sidonians. Notice what the wisest king on earth does, Brother Burkett. He hires the Sidonians to build the house. He goes to the world and says, can you build us one of those extravagant stone houses? I want this one not made with flesh. I want something more resolute. I want something strong. I want something immovable. I want something that is profound. I want to move from one dimension of glory to the next. We don't want just flesh that blows in the wind. We want a house that can stand against anything. We want a powerful house made of stone. And there's none amongst us like the Sidonians who can build stone houses. So... This wise king hires the world to build a stone house. And look what happens in verse 17. The king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, hewn stones, cut. I want you to cut the stones, lay the foundation of the temple. So Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, the Gibelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. Hear this. The reason why I'm reading this is it seems like a lot of just biblical knowledge. The reason why this is important is God allowed the wisest king in all the Old Testament to build a house made of cut stones. Stones that were cut by the world. I want, if I'm not going to dwell on flesh... If I'm going to move from one dimension of glory, a flesh house, to a resolute house, I want those stones cut by the world, though. I don't want this house to ever get credit for any other. I'm going to fall into this house. My glory is going to fill the house. But I want you to know that I chose to fall on cut stones. If we don't understand this revelation, that the wisest king in the Old Testament thought it not robbery to allow the house to be cut by the world in order for the glory of God to fall on it, we're not going to understand pandemics. We're not going to understand politics. We're not going to understand things that don't go our way. That God always falls on a house that was cut by the world. 
He falls in the room and he fills the house with his glory when it has been damaged, when it has been cut. And when we can look at a cut house, God can say, okay, I can fill the house up with my glory because the house won't get any credit. The builder won't get any credit. The only one that's going to get credit is me and me alone. I'm going to fill the house up with my glory, but it's going to be damaged. It's going to be broken. It's going to be cut on. And I might even even sometimes allow the world to do it. There might be problems around you. Well, God, that's not fair. I didn't tell you I was going to be fair. I told you I was going to be just. Justice and fairness are not the same thing. I'm going to have a resolute house. I'm here to tell you prophetically that the house of God in 2023 is going to be stronger than it has ever been. But it's going to be a house that's been cut by the world. This is not just some flesh house anymore. This is not just some weak church anymore. This is not just your regular everyday ragtag run of the mill church. There are people in the end times that are going to go through problems, but they're going to dig their heels in and say, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. There's going to be people that go through problems on this earth and they're going to say, God, it doesn't seem fair. It seems like you've forsaken me. And God's going to say, I'm going to fill that house with glory. And people are going to come into the house of God and see damaged individuals and wonder how can you still worship God when nothing has gone your way? And it's in that moment that you will testify to them. This is what faith looks like. And cutting is often what faith feels like. If you want to know what faith is like, go read Hebrews 11. It's not about people getting their way. It's not about blessings and more jobs and faster cars. It's about people. The Bible says that they were sawn in two. Hebrews 11 literally says, time doesn't afford me to tell you of the prophets, those persecuted, many dying in the faith, and those sawn in two, those whom the world was not worthy. Do you understand that when the church gets cut and they still stand resolute and stay, I even though he didn't, I still believe that he can. And even though it seems like he won't, I believe that he will. And when you stand there when nothing is going your way, that's when the world looks at you and says, you're something beyond hype. You are something deeper than just the fluff. You are more than just a TV church. You're more than just an Instagram worthy picture. You are something beyond all of that. You have a deeper relationship when people come into the house of God and they see cut stones filled with glory they look at you and they think oh yeah the reason why you're living for God is because everything's gone your way and you look at them and say no I have glory but that doesn't negate the cutting I have been cut on but I'm not looking at the scars I'm looking at the glory the glory is the only thing that matters that's when you move from a child of the faith to someone who's mature in the faith and that's when God can finally rest in the house we haven't been promised in fact he told us in this world you're gonna have trouble And I believe God is maturing the church. He's been doing it over the past three years. He's been growing the church up. And we cried in the beginning. We were frustrated. We just want things to go back to normal. We all said those things. But somewhere in the process, God allowed some sufferers to rise up who God never forsook, even though it seems like they had been betrayed and let go of. And there were men and women of God that says, when did God promise you easy? He promised you glory. Instagram has lied to you about pretty pictures. But God is always like bloody altars. When did we bleach the altar? Unfortunately, even the stone house was sold for astonishingly cheap. Solomon said, I'm going to build God a 5,000 square foot house. And I'm going to spend... Uh, I think I think seven years is good for God. But when I'm done, I'm going to build myself an 11,250 square foot house. And I'm going to spend, uh, I think 13 years for me is good. If I gave God seven, 13 is better for me. And he sold it for the astonishing low price of self. 
And God begins to move on because he's looking for a lowly house. If it's made of stone and it's resolute, it's the mature house, but it's still cut. If it's a, it's a flesh house, it's still humble. He likes those kind of houses. That's the kind of place that God can stretch out in. You have to really wrap your head around this. The God who is infinite can fill all space and time chose to sit on a four-foot mercy seat. I'm building a house right now, and we think we're moving on up because it's 1,800 square feet, and this is the biggest house we've ever had, and we're, man, we're stretching out. We feel spoiled right now building this house, and I look at God's mercy room. The Holy of Holies was four foot by four foot, and he said, I will sit on a mercy seat that is four foot by four foot as long as I get to meet with you. I never asked for extravagant. I never asked for you to be perfect. I didn't ask you to be in this perfect state before I'd come and dwell in the house. I want you to grow up, but I'll meet with you at immature as long as I get to see you face to face. And we always rate ourselves against the maturity of the people around us. And God is saying, I just want a house. I'll meet with you in the condition you're in. I don't want you to stay that way. I want you to sit with me long enough and I'll mature sure you, but as long as I get to meet with you, I'll hold the baby. If the baby cries, if the baby makes a mess, that's fine as long as I get the baby, but I don't want you to stay a baby, but I want to enjoy this season of you crying, so don't judge yourself against the mature, and we have a problem with church as we all come together. We often compare ourselves amongst ourselves, and that is not wise, but this 2,700 square foot house it was planted on Time Street, made out of cut stones, was diminishing. Herod comes along and he restores it. Herod, who is not the, not the poster child of, of morality by any means, he comes and he says, you know what would look good in this house? In the Old Testament, it only had one door to the Holy of Holies. The, in the Bible, you had to come from the east. And east was a type of sin. You, you know, the Bible says that Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden towards the east. And so to go home, we got to turn around. We got to go west. That's where you get the word repentance. It's tashuva in Hebrew. Turn around, go home. And that's what we do. And that's why God said, when you build the tabernacle, put my holy place west. So to get to me, you got to turn from the world. That's repentance. And so they did. They would turn and they would go to that western room. And the Holy of Holies was always in the west, everywhere in the Bible. And this is unique because Herod said, you know what? Let's create more roads to that room. And for the first time in Israelite history, there are multiple ways to get to the Holy of Holies. Even though in the Bible there was only one way in, you had to enter into his gates. And then you had to move from the labor of, of that, that. You had to move from the altar to the labor of water into his holy place. And there was one veil. There was not multiple roads. And our culture has told us that there's many ways that lead to Christ. Well, the Bible says there's one way. And he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, the world's always going to try to build a different house. And God says there's only one way into the home. But watch. We're moving from glory to glory. It starts with a tent made of flesh. Then it becomes resolute, made of cut stones. But then something happens. Because John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. But not only was it with Him, it was him. God is the word. So everything that he says is him. And then John says something unique. He says in John 1.14, and that word became. But there's a more powerful word in, that, in the Greek. And he dwelled. The word dwell in Greek is tabernacled. It's the same word used for the Old Testament tabernacle, but the Greek. He was a meeting place. And this is what John said. and said, we looked at that tent and we beheld the glory. As of the only unique is what that word begotten means. He's the only unique one. He is unique amongst humans. There's no human like him. He must be something more than human. 
And there was the tabernacle. He says, I'm moving you from glory to glory to glory. This is the house I was looking for, not made with human hands. This is the perfect house. And Jesus walks amongst them as a house not made with human hands. And he visits one day Herod's extravagant, distorted house that he came and added and modified and remodeled Solomon's temple. And he rebuilds it and adds these different rooms to serve different gods. And Jesus walks in and he looks in John. 2 14 and he says he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business and he made a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the changers money and he overturned the tables and he said to those who sold doves take these things away do not make my father's house a house of merchandise Stop selling this house for so cheap. It's worth more to me than doves and pigeons and rams and goats and sheep. It's worth more than that. The disciples looked and they were astonished. They didn't understand the authority because nobody in history has ever had the gumption to walk into the temple and to drive people out with a whip. And then it dawns on them because they were all Bible nerds. The scripture comes into their mind and they remembered, verse 17 says, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since, we, since you do these things? And he answered them and said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll build another one. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to remodel this thing. How in the world do you think you're going to raise it up in three days? After surveying the stone house of Herod, he flips over the tables and tries a remodeling project, which they weren't all about. And he began breaking ground for a new home in Luke 19. Watch this closely. I want to just, I want to blow your mind for a minute. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called to him. And they said, teacher, rebuke these people. How dare they say these things? And listen to Jesus' response. He answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones. Now, go with me here for a minute. I know I've preached it. We've all done it. I know that when we're trying to get from you a response we, and you're just kind of sitting there and you're not doing much, you're sitting like a bump on a log, we like to toss this scripture out. This is, this is our favorite, get a response out of the people scripture. If you won't praise him, the stones will do it. However, <laughs> the Greek word here is not the word used for random pebble. That's the word petros. That word was not used. If they wanted to use that word, they would have. Luke says... If you will not praise me, the lethos will cry out. That's the word for brick. <laughs> not just any brick. You just, if you go out here and you just find a random rock sitting out in the driveway, that's a, that's a Petros. But if you look on the walls that are holding up this building, those are lethos. Those are bricks that have been taken and they've been constructing, they've been used to be used in the construction of a house. Jesus looks at the house of Israel, the Pharisees, and he says, Israel, if you won't praise me, I got a whole pile of bricks stashed over there I'll build another house with. I got some Gentiles. No, I don't think, you, I don't think you're getting this. I've got some Hispanic people. I've got some Caucasian people. I've got some Asian people. I've got African people. I have some individuals that I'll build another house with. And Israel, if you won't praise me, I'll go and collect some stones. I'll go get some people and I'll build another house and I'll dwell in that one and I'll move right on into it and I'll move past you, Israel, and I'll find another group of people. As long as there are bricks, I will dwell there. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the chief cornerstone and I'm about to break some ground and start a whole neighborhood of people where I can rest. 
I got it. You got to understand this. I don't care if you're Pentecostal. I don't care what's on that sign out there because this movement started with the Methodist people as they were praying and seeking God. But then when they saw the people praising and worshiping together, multi-ethnic worship on Azusa Street, the Methodist church came in there and they said, this is filthy. This is sinful. We don't worship together like that. And guess what? The Methodist church is one of the fastest declining religions in our modern day. God said, I'll move on. And if he did it once, don't we dare think for just a moment that because we're Pentecostal, he won't move on to somebody else. We're already seeing at Asbury College right now that God is looking for bricks and he doesn't care what your denominal flavor is as long as you're in the book, as long as you follow the chief cornerstone, as long as you're being biblical. God is going to find a group of people and that's where his glory is going to fall. Musicians come. Brother Holloway, can you prove that? I'll prove it to you with scripture because Peter, who had who fought with this of reaching the Gentiles, I don't want to reach those Gentiles. And God tells him in Acts, don't call anything that I've made unclean. He gets a passion to reach the Gentiles and listen to what this, this preacher who only wanted to preach to Jewish people, listen to what he says in his letter. He says, coming to him as to a living stone. The word living is lethos. Watch. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. He's preaching to Gentiles. He said, I know that you're rejected by my Jewish people, but you have been chosen by God and you're precious. Remember what he told Solomon? He said, go and get some costly stones. Precious stones. Cut stones. And he says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. I wish the Bible was a little more Texas sometimes. I, I went through I went through school as a as a Hebrew translator, and translations are hard. I'll, I'll level with you. But there's one place that there's a translation that frustrates me. It's the one passage where it says that know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Because in the, the Greek, it actually says y'all. That's why I mean, I wish the Bible was a little more Texas. Because he says, know ye not that y'all are the temple? And see, we've gotten so arrogant, we read that passage and we say, I'm a temple of God. Honey, you're a brick. Everyone in this room is a brick that makes the temple. We collectively are the house of God. And when I join with you and you join with me, the house is getting stronger. Every brick that's added, every soul. But hear me, you don't get to just build a house how you want. There were blueprints to this house. And Jesus said, I'll be the chief cornerstone. I'll be the first brick and every person that follows the pattern of this first brick the house will be level somebody asked me they said what do you what do you like about what do you feel about the Asbury revival I said that's not a revival that's an awakening that's a difference it's an awakening that will lead to revival but revival can't happen without people that are reading their Bibles if that is just an emotion driven prayer meeting it will end I love Azusa Street and if you're about to get offended, then go read your Bibles. It's, it, I'm, it's, not, my, it's not my job to maintain your, your comfort. But Azusa Street was a failure. If it was a success, there should still be a church on Azusa Street. They were so emotional, they had no word. They were speaking in tongues and they thought, well, I can go overseas and I can preach in their language because I'm speaking in tongues. They had no word. So they all left and they went overseas and they got over there and they found out, well, that's not how this works at all. God honored them and here we are today, but God is requiring from us the emotional side and the word side. He's wanting us to be passionate people, spirit and truth. And he's looking for people that'll grow up and be people of the word. 
And if we will stop being people of the word, we won't be this flesh that's blown in the wind. We'll become stone. And when we get cut, we'll become glorified. We'll be coming from one dimension of we've been sanctified. We've been justified. God is getting ready to pour out the glorification on the church. But the glorification don't come on people who don't read their word. If Azusa Street today is going to be a success, it's got to have to be the same passion they had for the things of the Spirit. We cannot lose the things of the Spirit. We have to be people of prayer. We have to be people that shout. We have to be people that run. We have to be people that intercede. We have to be people who pray. We have to be people who evangelize. But when we come together and all the world's doing their stuff, we need to look at it and say, that's not right. It's not in the book. When you're perusing through social media and you hear a preacher and you say, whoa, that sounds good. But I can't see any scripture for that. I'm here to prophesy to you. God is getting ready to glorify his church. His church is going to be stronger than it's ever been. And I'm speaking to the first church right now. I felt a word in prayer for you this morning. And God said, I'm pleased with my servant and I'm going to give them everything that they've been seeking. Everything I've told them I'm going to do for them, I'm going to do. And to the people of this church, I believe that this is going to be the strongest church that you've seen in the history of First Church. There's going to be powerful anointing and prayer meeting, but there's going to be powerful demonstrations of the word as well. Get ready. Get ready. I want you to stand with me. Brother Burkett, if you can come up here, Brother Gentry. If you, if you two guys can just come up here. No, in fact, y'all stay right here. Can I, get, can I get two of the ministers that were in the office? Any two. That were in the office with me at 9 o'clock. Thank you, brother. Brother, if you don't mind, you can come up here. Yes, sir. I want y'all to just stand right here. I want you to link up arm in arm. This is not something God gave me in studying. Sierra, this is not something God just spoke to me one day and said, hey, you know what will preach? I was flying to California. If you guys can just stand right over here for a second. I was flying to California, and I landed in San Francisco, and when the wheels of my plane hit the, hit the tarmac, God started stirring in my spirit something. This was right before the pandemic. So I'm flying over there, and I could just feel something stirring within my soul. So I hurried up, and I went and got my bag. I got into my car, and I started driving to Modesto, California. I was going to get ready to preach for Brother Johnson, Brother Randy Keys. I'm on my way over there. And so I walked to the hotel, and I was just, you got to understand me sometimes when I'm zoned in, I'm, I'm trying to hear from the voice of God. And I told the pastor, I said, look, something's stirring in me. i got to get to the room. I don't want to ignore you, but I need, to, I need to go see what God's getting ready to say. I walked into the room, and when I opened that door and I walked in, the door shut behind me. I was caught up, and I saw a vision from heaven. And I saw all these bricks falling from heaven, and they were stacking up. And it built this big wall. And I saw a hand come down from heaven, and it wrote on the wall, Acts 2. And I said, God, what are you showing me? He said, I started construction of my house in Acts 2. It started with one brick as the chief cornerstone. Then 120 bricks got added. And later that afternoon, I added 3,000 people to that wall. He said, and I started construction in that moment. And then all of a sudden, I saw on this side, I saw bricks started falling. They started to come up here, guys. And if I can get you two guys, come over here. Just, you two. Yeah. Just go link up with them. I want you all to turn this way. I saw the wall turn. And I saw on there great awakening and I said oh God what are you doing he said I'm building this house he said in every wall that's added this house is going to get stronger he said don't listen don't listen to what people tell you about the church he said this house is going to be strong and I'm standing and I'm looking at it and then I saw bricks started falling again guys if you can come up here and the lady, in fact I want some ladies I want some ladies coming to it in fact all ladies if you can just come over here and just link right here appropriate. If I can just get some get some ladies. Thank you, sis. Thank you, sis. Come over here. Because this isn't just a man house. And as these bricks begin to fall, I'm standing and I'm looking at it and I'm in awe. And I looked and I saw a handwriting on the wall. He said, that was my Azusa Street Revival. He said, every single wall, there was another burst of revelation that I poured out. The revelation here was that I am God. And the mighty God was in Christ. They had a powerful revelation of how to build these walls and how to become stones. I started that there. Over here, I revived passionate prayer. And over here, I activated and I revived the gifts of the Spirit. He said, but I'm not done. 
And I looked up at the top corner of that wall, and there was just a few bricks left. It's before the pandemic, and he said, I'm going to finish this wall in the next two years. I'm going to call some people home, and the wall is going to be done. And I watched over the years, as I watched Brother Eli Hernandez, Brother George Guy, powerful men and women of God, as they went on to glory, God told me, he said, that was it. That was the last bricks on that wall. I'm done with it. The Azusa Street dispensation is done. He said, I've given you my Godhead, my salvation, my prayer, my gifts. And now I'm about to show you the last and final wall. But before the final wall was built, I saw this compass coming down from heaven. And I saw it spin. And I saw that this was the eastern wall. He said, this was the entrance into my house. This final wall was the western wall. Why is that important? Because the western wall was where the glory of God was. I said, oh, so God, what are you going to do? He said, I have shown you all my revelation. I'm pouring out one final spurt of revelation. He said, it's going to be glory. I'm going to pour out my glory on this final wall. It's going to be a glorified wall. It was sanctified. It was justified. But now it's going to be glorified. I want some of you people, just some of you, come up here. I want you to link arms. And you got to understand, I don't care who the president is. I don't care what politics say. I don't care what religion tells you. I don't care what damages happen. I don't care how much Fox and CNN and CBS fights. I don't care about shots. I don't care about masks. I'm not, I'm not going to get eat up and consume with all that stuff. I want you to come over here and link up with them because what I can see and what God has shown me that when this wall starts getting built, the church is going to be far stronger than she's ever been. She's going to be cut on because stones always get cut by the world. But when stones get cut by the world, the Bible tells us that the glory of God fills that house. But watch this. I want you to see one last thing. Let me get inside the house. Let me get inside the house. Here's what floored me with this. I was listening to Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. He was showing people the royal tour, and he walks them to the temple mount. He says, yeah, I know there's no temple standing here. He said, but you see that western wall? He said, it's still standing. And he said, come here, let me show you why. He brought them underground. And when they got underground, there was a stone there. It was longer than a bus. It was not damaged. They don't even know how it got there. He said, as best we can tell, they must have started with this stone because there's no way they could move it. They must have said, we can build on that stone. And so they started with that stone and they built the wall. He said, when Rome came against the temple, he said, they destroyed it, but they could not tear down this wall. And they said, why? He said, because Rome didn't come against the wall. He said, Rome came against the stone that was underground. He said, as long as that stone's underground, this wall will never come down. And so the Jews go to the Western Wall every day and they pray unto God right there at that wall. They have no idea that there's a stronger wall in their midst and it's the living church of the powerful spirit-filled God Almighty in this hour. This is the final wall. And guess what? You're the foundation. You understand the weight and the gravity that I cannot let go of acts. I cannot let go of prayer meetings. I cannot let go of the gifts. But with all that, I need to get more revelation of knowledge of his word. I can't be moved by the emotional side. I need to have it, but I need to be grounded in the word. Because when I plant myself on the word of God, I don't care what comes against me. The word that's been put inside of this house, I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. Everything's going to be shaken, the Bible says. But I'm going to be planted on a firm foundation. He which builds his house house on the rock even when the winds blow against it it will not fall this is not going to be a church that builds itself on the sand this is going to be a strong church here in a moment 
want you to flood these altars and I want you to join with the body of people. But I got one last thing. God showed me one final thing in this vision. Brother Burkett, here's the one that floored me. I heard a voice in this vision. It said, how will you build the final wall? And I saw God reach up on a shelf and he pulled a lump of clay off. And it was the last lump. There was no more clay on the shelf. It was the final lump of clay. And he grabbed it and he put it on a potter's wheel and he began to spin it and he took one piece of clay at a time off. And I saw it as they were formed and they were people. And I heard another voice say, is this it? Is that it? Is that the final lump? And I heard God say, yes. This is the final lump of clay. He said, all my experience that these hands, the hands that formed Paul, Peter, Phoebe, Timothy's grandmother, Apollos, Elisha, Moses, Samuel, Tamar, Rebecca, Ruth, all that experience I'm putting in the last lump. And then I heard God say these words. And here's where I want you to get your purpose right here. He said, I could have chosen to put this last lump in any part of the house but I chose them for the final things you could have been put in 1901 you could have been put in the 16th century you could have been put in Acts 2 but for some reason the wisdom of God looked and said you I'll trust with the end times you I'll trust with the pandemic you I'll trust with the internet you, I'll trust with social media. You, I'll trust you with YouTube. You, I'll trust you with the digital age. You, I'll trust you with cell phones. You, I'll trust you with carnality running rampant in the world. You, I'll trust you with racial injustice. You, I'll trust you with division in the world. You, I'll trust you with multiple religions and all of them fighting. You, I'll trust you with the end times because the end of a thing is always better than its beginning. If God did all of this in Acts 2, what is he doing with you right now in the end times? He didn't put you anywhere else. He trusted you now for such a time as this. And so what a war affirmation do you and I need? God trusted us with the end times. But if you're here today and you've never been filled with glory, come up here and follow the chief cornerstone. Die the way he died through repentance. Be buried the way he was buried, but in baptism. Resurrect the way he resurrected on the third day and get the tree of eternal life through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And then let us grow up to the glorified church. I want you to run up here with these bricks and I want us together as one unified body as you come to the altars. I want you to throw those hands up in the air and I want you to get a revelation that you are more than just a face in a building right now. You are more than just another person. You are more than just a statistic. You are more than just a number on the on the roll. You are more than just some average individual. You are bricks chosen by God for this last hour. And God is going to have a powerful end time church. And the way he's hardwired to do it is he's doing it through the people now. He didn't choose pyramids. He didn't choose anything else. This is why he didn't buy a house in his earthly ministry. He didn't even buy a tomb because he's not going to live in a house. He's not going to live in a tomb. But he paid the ultimate price for us bricks because that's where he's going to dwell. Come on, you hold a unique place in prophetic history. You're in the last hours and God is building this final wall. If you're a guest, we would love nothing more than if you would join up here with fellow cut stones. We have problems too. We've been damaged as well. We've been hurt. We felt rejected as well. Would you just join with us? We're not here to boast in all of our perfections. We're here to talk to you about the glory of God. And we 
wants you to have it as well. If you're a guest, would you lift up your hands? God wants to fill you with his glory. But Brother Holloway, I've been cut on. Yeah, so have we, and so was he. He was cut on the cross, and that's how he gave us this glory. 